Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. So I finally found a new place to work uh, and it's being put together slowly. So please bear with me as the space evolves. But right now at least those annoying lines from my closet are gone and I just have a plain white wall. All right, so today's morning movie news is going to demonstrate what a grip uh, Disney has right now on Hollywood, because they're able to do, once again, a straight flush on morning movie news. Uh, we've got a story from Disney uh, of each of their brands, not even including Pixar. Pixar didn't even make the cut, uh, and Pixar doesn't make the cut a lot these days. Who would have thought, back in their uh, heady days of Finding Nemo and the first few Toy Stories, that one day they would become Disney's weakest brand. I don't think anyone at Pixar ever imagined that. And, uh, I'm sure fans and uh, people at the company and shareholders all are equally surprised to see Pixar having to really rebound if it can next year with two new films. But we've got a Marvel story, we've got a Disney animation story, and we've also got a Lucasfilm story. And then Marvel comes back again, this time in the TV department with our viewer question. All right, so starting out, we have an Avengers 2 story which surfaced. It's coming from a tabloid out in the UK, but it sounds reasonable, uh, and I think it's an interesting story, especially in the light of uh, how things are going at the box office for Mockingjay Part 1. So what's the story? Well, the rumor is, is that Joss Whedon has asked uh, a group of actors in the Avengers 2 Age of Ultron, interesting list, by the way, we'll get to it in a moment, uh, but he's asked them to clear two weeks in January to do some reshoots. Yes, the Avengers 2 Age of Ultron is apparently not perfect. Uh, I think a lot of us would beg to differ from that trailer, but Joss Whedon feels it can be better. So the group that he's asked to uh, put some time aside, he says he isn't necessarily going to use them, but he'd like to have them available, as apparently he's still writing up these new scenes. So, and although some people would say that his meddling in Thor The Dark World uh, led to a weaker film there, so maybe he shouldn't touch it, maybe only Kevin Feige should be the one to do last minute revisions, but they're, they're fiddling with it. So the people that he wants to have are, of course, Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is like, I will drop anything after the judge to do anything for Marvel. So he's uh, asked to uh, hold some time. Chris Hemsworth, that's good for Thor. Thor's been having some problems, but he is the sexiest man alive. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, good. Any more Hulk that we can get, the better. Uh, Jeremy Renner, uh, of course, Hawkeye. Then Paul Bettany, the Vision, so that's interesting. Maybe uh, Joss Whedon's looking at the cut saying, I need more Vision. Uh, Scarlett Johansson, that's great. No longer pregnant. Maybe they're like, you know, we've, we're hiding her face too much. It's become obvious. Let's get some more face shots in there. And then also, this is interesting, Tom Hiddleston. Uh, Loki, big favorite. Uh, it was widely said he wasn't going to even be in the Avengers 2 Age of Ultron. He was going to take a bit of a breather because he was being overused. And yet, uh, lo and behold, uh, Joss Whedon might think that he needs him after all. So what I think is very interesting is the reason it was given for these reshoots. Why, why does Joss Whedon feel he needs to go back and add more to the film? Well, he feels there isn't enough action. And that's why I think this uh, ties in with what's happening to Mockingjay Part 1 at the box office, and that there's some speculation that one of the reasons that film isn't doing well is because it has a lack of action. Too much talking. Uh, so maybe Joss Whedon might be, and Joss Whedon, as we all know, is a fan of dialogue. So he might be like, ah, now that I see what's happening to Mockingjay, maybe the strength of the brand isn't enough to carry a film into a, a different terrain and a different uh, formula of action versus dialogue, and I need to pump up my movie. I think this is a good idea. I think that this kind of film, you can never go wrong with more action. And I would also agree that after Mockingjay, this is, uh, has been underlined. But in a big comic book movie, especially with all the other comic book films that are coming out, even from Marvel itself, each one has to raise the bar. And I think that Avengers Age of Ultron needs to be like the comic book movie to end all comic book movies. And it needs to make a big bang because Batman v Superman is coming. And if there's one thing Zack Snyder is going to get right in that movie, it's the action. So I think that it's a good idea to uh, add some more action sequences, and I hope they uh, feature Scarlett Johansson and Bruce Banner, my favorite characters. And also maybe uh, Paul Bettany is the vision. But also it might be interesting to you that Chris Evans was not, uh, not asked to hold any time. Perhaps they feel there's enough of him in there. We've seen his broken shield in the trailer. He might have enough of a character arc. And maybe they're you know leaning a little too heavy on Captain America after the success of his second film. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now let's head over to another department at Disney. We don't even have to leave the lot, and that's Disney Animation. 
Now, a big headline over the Thanksgiving weekend was Idina Menzel seeming to confirm uh, out in the UK, she did an interview out there, uh, she's promoting this holiday album that she has coming out. She was in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade to promote it. Uh, and someone asked her about Frozen. And they, she was like, yes, they're doing a sequel, Frozen 2, in the Broadway play. I don't know if I'm going to be in the Broadway musical, but I'm really hoping to be a part of Frozen 2. And the internet went crazy. And I think that they went crazy at the offices of Disney Animation. Because sure enough, uh, this more, uh, yesterday morning, uh, Idea Menzel was on the Today Show again promoting this uh, album. And they asked her specifically, and they said, hey, Idina Menzel, what was this Frozen 2 comment? And I think she probably asked them to have her clarify it so that she could say, I made an assumption, guys. There's no official confirmation that Frozen 2 is in the works. I just felt, duh, it's a no-brainer. She was much more uh, polite about it, though, because she does not want to tick, tick off those people at Disney Animation. So the only things that are confirmed, besides, of course, the current Disney on Ice Frozen edition that's going around making a ton of money across the country right now, but all we have is the Frozen Forever, that short, uh, or Frozen Fever, I at least forget which one it is. It's an alliteration. But we have the short coming, like, like a six minute short that's, you know, fast approaching. They're going to probably stick it in front of maybe Moana or, you know, Zootopia, one of their upcoming Disney animation movies. Uh, I don't think they'd put it in front of Pixar and Disney animation has nothing slated for 2015. But we have the short. We have all the stuff going on at Once Upon a Time, obviously. We have the stage show. That's definitely confirmed. I think I'm missing something here. Oh, yes. The ride. The maelstrom at Norway is being converted into a frozen ride. So those are the only things that are, that are confirmed. The frozen short, the ride, and the Broadway show. But there's no sequel confirmed. Disney Animation and the Disney Company have been very clear about no sequel in the works for Frozen. Now you might think, like Idina Menzel, how could you not make a sequel? They've made a ton of Toy Stories. They're making a Toy Story 4. And to maybe Toy Story 4 feels they were unseated as the most successful animated film of all time, so they must fight to earn the title back. Must Frozen rally uh, to try and win it back again? And I would say, I can see where Disney Animation is actually coming from here for two reasons. One, one of the reasons that Elsa is so popular is because she's so, I don't, I don't want to say poorly, she's left, she's left a blank, uh, blank page, let's put it that way. Elsa is left as a blank page, which allows fans to fill her in however they would like. So if they're to have a whole new story, a whole new movie, you know, a short is one thing, but an entire film, that leaves a lot of uh, room for error and the fact that they could, you know, perhaps create certain aspects to Elsa's personality, what kind of romantic interest do you give her, considering there's a large part of the LGBT community that wants to see her as uh, a, one of Disney's first gay characters? Uh, you know, how do you do that without maybe potentially losing a big chunk of the fandom, right? So there's the blank slate aspect to the character. Now also, if you're going to do a Frozen 2, how can you ever hope to duplicate the success of Let It Go? I mean, there's no other song on the soundtrack that comes even close. I guess, do you want to build a snowman's very popular, but it's no Let It Go. So I think there's also some concern there. Uh, as good as the Lopez's might be, uh, you know, they have no other song. It's all, you know, it's not like Howard Ashman who, you know, is knocking him out of the park with movie after movie and, uh, you know, just captivating people with entire soundtracks. Uh, so I, I can see why, you know, Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez would be like, you know, maybe they are even reluctant to try it again and maybe they just want to give Let It Go a little more room to breathe. I mean, it's a cash cow. And you don't want to make the milk go sour. So I'm curious to what you guys think. Would you, would you sequel or not sequel? Now, for the third story, it's about Lucasfilm. And this is looking like it might become Disney's most valuable brand after all, which is amazing considering the huge amount of, uh, amounts of money they have on the table already. But the Star Wars teaser trailer, of course, debuted on Black Friday, big holiday weekend. People had plenty of other things to do, but they made time in their schedule to watch this trailer. They watched it a ton of times, and it was reported that the first 72 hours for this trailer they had 40 million views. That is the most to date. Uh, so far, the big trailers of the year have been Fifty Shades of Grey, that are for uh, trailers that are for upcoming films. Fifty Shades of Grey clocked 36.4 million views in four days. And then Avengers 2 Age of Ultron, that was the previous record holder. It broke Fifty Shades streak with 50.6 million views in five days. But Star Wars seems to be doing better than all of them. And I think that's very interesting indeed. Marvel's like, oh man, we were sitting pretty here at the top of the Disney, uh, you know, uh, ladder of success, but it looks like uh, Lucasfilm is going to be a force to be reckoned with. And it's interesting because there was so little interest in anything Star Wars leading up to this. But I think the trailer, the teaser trailer, it's a teaser trailer, but I think this shows how successful the teaser trailer uh, 
was executed. It's a true tease. Uh, instead of just, you know, a regular length trailer that's called a teaser trailer, it really does tease the film. So I think you have fans looking at it because they want more. It's like, oh, it really gives you that feeling of like not enough. So you're excited about it, but you don't feel like your itch has been scratched by watching it once. So they have no choice but to watch it multiple times. Then because it's a teaser trailer and the shots were picked very carefully, there's lots of things to like Easter eggs to, you know, uh, digest if you go frame by frame. And even if there aren't, people are, you know, definitely going to try because they're just hungry for information. So you have people watching that a lot. You might, you might remember that the teaser trailer for Avengers 2 Age of Ultron was just the Ultron head turning and some sound bites from previous films. Uh, there's nothing to, to, you know, to dissect there, so that maybe was a mistake on Marvel's part. I think a lot of people will be studying this teaser trailer going forward for what kind of teaser trailers they want to release for their films. Now, in addition to all the Easter eggs and, you know, the lack of information, uh, I think that that succeeded because the tone was so perfect. Uh, you have the mix of nostalgia, you know, the music was definitely there, uh, but while things had that nostalgia factor, they still seemed fresh and new. New characters, new setups, new scenarios, and so that was very exciting. Uh, then the other thing, of course, was controversy. If you add a dash of controversy to anything, it's really going to go into hyperdrive. Or, uh, you know, uh, light, uh, oh, light speed. So I think that that's very, very cool. But the nostalgia, of course, is with John Boyega as the first face that you see in the trailer. And it's a, a black face. And a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, I don't see this racism. You know, the media is just trying to stir up a storm. But it's there. Uh, it's probably on areas of the internet you don't go to because, you know, you don't feel that way. But it's, it's big enough that John Boyega, as I talked about in Movie Math yesterday, felt the need to address it on Instagram, telling everybody who didn't support him in the film, get used to it. Uh, it's a bold statement. It was a bold move to show him first, as I said in my trailer review. But uh, I think that it added spark and interest to this trailer and helped, you know, make a perfect storm of viewership. So I'm curious, how many times did you watch the Star, uh, Star Wars Episode 7 The Force Awakens trailer? Uh, and what do you think of it performing better than the Fifty Shades of Grey trailer, which I'm sure you're very happy about, but also the Avengers 2 Age of Ultron trailer? And in the current, uh, you know, constellation or setup in Hollywood, what do you think currently is Disney's most valuable brand? Uh, and if, uh, it's probably Marvel, but I think Disney Animation with Frozen is giving it a run for its money. But how about Lucasfilm? How do you feel this is going to upset the balance of power over the Disney studios? Uh, and also, is this a monopoly at this point? Maybe the, uh, you know, the government should investigate. All right, so on to the viewer question, which has to do, as I said, with Marvel television. And this comes from Vladimir, and Vladimir's last name, I'm not even going to do him the disservice of completely butchering it, uh, but Vladimir is a BTT viewer from Serbia. I thought that was so great to get a question from uh, the other side of the globe. So Vladimir says, question, hey Grace, first off let me say that I love the show, I watch it every day, although over here in Serbia it's more like evening movie news. Well, good evening Vladimir, thank you for your question. And so Vladimir says, as for my question, I was hoping you could give us your thoughts on some, give us your thoughts on something. What do you think of Marvel's Agent Carter? To me it seems that one of the topics the show will talk about a lot is female empowerment, which I think will be a nice change of pace. Since it's about a woman doing a stereotypically male job in the 40s, no less, I think this could finally be Marvel's big female hero. They've already shown in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that her name is well known and respected among agents. And Haley Atwell has proven that she can do the job nicely in Captain America. Plus, the teaser for Agent Carter looks fantastic. I hope, to you, uh, I hope you find the time to discuss this. Thanks, smiley face. Uh, great, great uh, observation, Vladimir. And I think that it's interesting because, you know, Wonder Woman is considering going back in time for her movie, obviously, but Agent Carter is already there. And also, the Wonder Woman sequel wouldn't hit the 40s until it's, uh, the Wonder Woman film wouldn't hit the 40s until it's sequel. It wants to start out like in the 1920s or uh, a little bit before then when women are first getting the vote. But uh, Haley Atwell's Agent Carter, Peggy Carter, is already back in time and she's making waves. Uh, starting up S.H.I.E.L.D. I think that this is a delicate balance, just like we've discussed with Wonder Woman. You want to have female empowerment, but you don't want it to seem like a show just for women. And even women get tired of hearing about female empowerment. We want it to exist, but at the end of the day, as I always say, we just want to be equal. We just want to be a member of the group, as I think every demographic feels. I think even when we talk about diversity, I don't think John Boyega wants to be the black stormtrooper. He just wants to be a stormtrooper. And I think that's really admirable, and that's the attitude we all should be taking. 
So I think that Agent Carter needs to be a show about the founder of S.H.I.E.L.D. first. And I think that Haley Atwell is the perfect person for that job. I really loved the job that she did in Captain America, the first Avenger. I was sad to see that they didn't use her for Sharon Carter, because it's supposed to be her relative to the point where when Cap uh, in the comics comes out of his, uh, you know, his ice coma, he's like, oh, Peggy? And they're like, no, this is her descendant, Sharon. And he's like, oh, hey, it's not creepy, right? Maybe it is. Let's pretend it's not. Uh, but I thought that I was like, hey, just dye her hair blonde, stick a blonde wig on her, let's go. Because I thought she did such a nice job. But I'm glad she's been rewarded with the television show, and I hope it turns out better than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Although, to be fair, plenty of you say that show has come around. But I do think this could be a strong, uh, you know, character for Marvel, but I question what they can really do with it. Because they have, uh, even though they're supposed to occupy the same universe, you're not seeing really any crossover. And maybe she could head over to the Defenders over on Netflix. Maybe that's like the first baby step in crossovers we can do here. But I don't see her popping up too much in the movies. Maybe like in a picture in S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, that would be cool. Although, who knows when we'll see a S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters again. Uh, and also, that's interesting for the show itself, you know, what, what happens to S.H.I.E.L.D. in the future. Uh, Peggy would be devastated. But she doesn't remember anything, so I guess she's okay. Oh, so a horrible <laughs> Alzheimer's joke. Not funny. All right, so, but anyway, uh, yes, I agree, and I'm curious to see the show, and I probably will tune in to watch this, even though I haven't been happy with any of Marvel Studios' television efforts, live action, or animated. But I'm curious to what you guys think. Do you want to see Agent Carter be, you know, a little bit about girl power, or do you think it should avoid that like the plague? And what do you think of S.H.I.E.L.D. having a female head? What do you think of this evolution for the, char the character of Peggy Carter? It's, it's a change that the movies and the you know, the cinematic universe is doing, do uh, you think it should be reflected in the comics? And of course, don't forget Howard Stark is in there because there's a Stark everywhere. All right, thank you so much for tuning in today's morning movie news. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please write down what you think of the top three stories, the viewer question, any questions you have uh, yourself for tomorrow, any stories that you'd like to see covered. Thanks for watching. Bye.